Okay, three, two, one, and we're live on the Metabolic Motivation Show today. Really excited uh, to have Dr. Andre Panagos, uh, who's in New York City. Good morning, doctor. Thanks for making time for us. How are you today? Good, Dan. How are you? Thanks for letting me be on your show this morning. Oh, wonderful. It's, uh, it's my pleasure, uh, your work. Well, the most important thing for me and the thing that brings me to work every single day is getting people phenomenally better, especially when they might have seen other physicians and they've not really gotten anywhere whatsoever. So when we are able to get people off of medicines or getting them back to what they wanted to do, like sports or other athletic endeavors, it really makes a huge impact on my life day to day. And it really makes my job the most enjoyable thing that I can possibly do. Oh, that's wonderful. It's great to see. So you got a mixture of you know, the passion for helping people and then your right. specialized expertise. And uh, how would you describe your approach? The approach that we take is really all-inclusive. So it really takes in from a functional medicine standpoint, sort of nutrition and how you're living your life day to day to more of the medical and uh, scientific in the sense of looking at journal articles, references to try to figure out how to get you as, um, as topped off as possible to do that you, what you want to do. The thing that we've noticed is our body is actually more resilient than we give it credit. If we but keep not, not giving it the, the, the correct nutrients, nutrients the correct, um, let's say, um, inputs like exercise or stretching, we start breaking down. And we start seeing that early on in some people, actually, really in the early 30s, but some people are more resilient. So we start seeing that later in the 60s and 70s. So the whole concept of the aging process is really a number. It's really what you're doing with your body and how you're living your life that really makes a huge, huge impact. Well, that's, a, that's a great point. So would that speak to the, the difference between uh, what, uh, you know, we often, I think the average person doesn't really uh, or may not be exposed to the idea of your biological age compared to your chronological age, and they can be very different. Is Correct. That, can you speak to us about, about that? So the, the chronological age is one where we just assume that the population will age at a certain rate. What we've found is in just seeing tens of thousands of people over time, there's significant differences in how we age. There are some people in their late 90s who are in tremendous shape, living independently, engaging with their uh, social network and, and getting around and doing what they want to do. Most importantly, being independent. Yes. We have young people who are horribly in pain and I really didn't believe this or understand this until I started keeping meeting people who are actually, they'd lost their life. So let's say they've had a major injury or they had a major event in their life and literally their life crumbled around them. Yes. So we asked questions of, how did you get out of this? Because theoretically you're not supposed to. Uh, the, the typical um, approach in the United States is if you have some sort of chronic disease or chronic pain syndrome, which we focus on mostly in this practice, you become... Uh, um, you're set up on chronic disability, and really your life is pretty much over at that point in the sense of income and, and getting out there. Right. But we have people who have overcome that, and I, I am really excited because I have, uh, I guess one of my claims to fame, at least personally, is that I've been able to get people off of chronic disability. Uh, research wow. suggests that when you're on chronic disability, you're not going to get off. And it actually has shown that after about two years, if you haven't worked, you're not going to go back to work. But we've actually put people back to work. And it's actually been quite amazing because it's possible. And, and I wasn't really understanding that in the first place. So we asked these people who went back to work, what did you do? How did you get back there? And really, they were using simple ideas. Getting good amounts of sleep, getting the proper nutrition, getting back engaged with their friends and their, their, their loved ones, being part, being part of society again. And, and slowly whittling away the crutches that uh, modern medicine gave them to just get them through. And what's really surprising is they actually not only feel better, but they actually cure themselves. And it's just, it's mind boggling. But I can't write a research paper on it because there's no objective criteria that I can say, look, this measure got better, this measure got better. We have uh, subjective measures that we use in medicine, but they're not very good when you use one or two patients. You need a good 10, 15, sometimes even 50. So. These are the stories and the philosophies that we've seen, and to be honest, it's really tremendously changed the kind of practice that we have. Yeah, that's wonderful to hear. So, um, so what you, what's your basically your experience? You're talking about your experience, uh, you know, in the real world, actually seeing these these um, you know fantastic results. So, uh, and I, and I think you know sometimes we, um, I feel like scientifically we 
we get enamored with these mega population studies with thousands and thousands of people, and we forget that how many things in the history of the human race have been discovered simply by a person like yourself who is paying attention to uh, to different variables and just, and seeing, hey, this is actually giving me this result. Or as you were saying, you've um, you spent uh, um, you were smart enough to to be and curious enough to ask these people, hey, what did you do? It's just sort of deconstructing, right? You know. I'm sort of laughing because uh, it all started because one of my patients said, "Hey, do you have a time? Do you have time for a story?" And I said, "Sure, I have a little bit of time. Tell me your story." And then he he challenged me and said, "Well, why don't you try it and see what how you feel?" I said, "Sure, not a problem." My uh, I thought I was going to become a researcher, so I spent a huge amount of time in research libraries in the in New York City area. Uh, read over 2,000 articles, even wrote a book on the spine, thinking, okay, I've read so many articles, I'm really going to be really robust on my knowledge. Yes. What I realized is that a lot of research is really, it was good, it was better than nothing, but it really asked a lot of questions that we couldn't answer, and a lot of research isn't done on the really good questions. So I started really expanding around, saying, okay, what about this, what about that? Um, one of my patients challenged me and said, you know, I think acupuncture works really well, but my scientific method said, no, it can't work. It doesn't make sense. So I took an acupuncture course, and I was shocked, and it totally reset my entire thinking as to how do you make people better, how do you get them more engaged in what they need to do. And so from those two humbling experiences, I'm much more open-minded as to how we treat patients nowadays, and with that, we're much more successful than we have before. Well, that's, that's fantastic. It's, uh, um, I've had a, a number of interviews with... Um with uh, holistic-minded physicians, uh, some are, some call it, I guess some call it integrative medicine. How would you describe, would, do you have a, I know there's not really a defined label, but uh, if, if you had to put a label on your approach, is there a sound bite out that you have? Well, really, the, the approach that we have is more of a functional, integrative approach, bringing in the best of any tradition to get the patient back on their feet. Um, we, we don't really say that this is bad or that's bad. We really just keep an open mind and really ask the patient if there's really no risk in doing something that you're going to do, let's try it for several months and see what happens. And sometimes the results are quite remarkable. Yeah, I love that idea. You know, because it's, would you agree that, that many times we even, you know, obviously there's a variability biologically between people and it's impossible to know the, I guess in any type of treatment, what's good, the results that's good, that would give you the, uh, or what treatment right. is going to give you the best results? Exactly. Um, we were doing some research on just nutrition because uh, a number of people say, you know, you should have this level of nutrition or that level of nutrition. And, and several articles suggest that the differences in our requirements for nutrition actually are 40-fold different. So one person may need, just as an example, let's say 400 units of vitamin D, Someone else may need 20,000 units, and it also could relate to where you live. And the, the standard recommended daily allowance doesn't necessarily encompass that huge variability. And we see that in patients every single day. Let's say we give someone 10,000 units or 5,000 units of vitamin D, and we test their blood eight weeks later, we may find that there's no change. And so the question is whether they need more, or are they absorbing enough, or what's going on and right. preventing them from getting it. Other people, you get, you get a test, and they're very high, and they're doing great. Right. Oh, that's fascinating. So you've it's seen that, with, you know, with a with with a patient taking five thousand units of vitamin D, and some get a great result, and some show almost no, maybe no change. After. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So what what would were you able to to come up with any theory of what the, what was it a, uh, as far as to explain why some people would get no results? Would it be something with their maybe their GI tract absorption issues or something like that or any any way any ideas? Well, it's kind of a, it's kind of a strange thing to say, but we're just a collection of chemical reactions, and how we respond to our environment is really based on those chemical reactions, our genetics as well. The the, the whole concept of uh, decoding our genome is going to be wonderful because finally the concept of personalized medicine will be here, and we'll be shocked at the kind of medicine we'll be practicing in 100 years from now as compared to today because we're going to be actually treating people specifically for their condition versus sort of a generalization based on, you know, they have really great population studies of 10, 20,000 people. Um, the Framingham study has been going on for decades and that gives us great information. 
but it also tells us how a lot of our preconceived ideas don't necessarily hold up long term. And so it's not about getting people better for the time being. I can make people better in minutes with anesthetic, but it's about several months later, are they engaged, are they back to their life, and can they do it? So when I, when I think about research, I try to bring in the best of everything, but really keep an open mind as to really where the, where the patient's going and how they're responding. We spend a lot of time talking to patients, just trying to get an inkling as to what are they really asking for and what is the specific problem. And is it a problem or is it not? Uh, right. The unfortunate thing is we don't have a panel that says, okay, this is bad, this is good. It's really just a conversation as to is it an issue, is it not? Can we really dig through and identify the underlying cause? So it's uh, it's almost detective work in many ways. Yes, that's interesting. That the so health, yeah, being a health detective is uh, is that would be an interesting. It should be actually would be a great job. I mean, there's so many so many <laughs> yes. you know university uh, you know programs that don't have any real world um, benefit or job opportunities these days. That would be a wonderful. Let's be a health detective, <laughs> and uh, that's wonderful, fantastic. Well. You know, let's um, let me think. I've got so many questions, and I know we're limited on time. Uh, let me ask you one: uh, if you know, because this will be listened to probably by some professionals as well as lay people. Uh, what would you say from your experience? Uh, you know, if you were to, uh, you've learned many, many, many things. Uh, what would be the the three best tools uh, that you have in your toolbox as far as small hinges that swing big doors? Well, the, the, the big things, and research has really demonstrated this over and over again, but a lot of us just don't do it. Proper sleep, because with proper sleep, uh, when I say proper sleep, it's not four hours, and it's also not the same for everyone. Some people can do phenomenally well five hours of sleep. Thomas Edison basically took catnaps and never really slept as we assume we should sleep. Uh, some people need nine or ten hours. If you get proper sleep, now there's two things that your body does. One is... It cleans out the toxins that have developed throughout the day. Yes. But also, there's actually certain growth factors that are released, specifically actually growth hormone, that actually works to repair the damage from the day. So the thought is, if you're not actually getting adequate sleep, your body's not able to maintain the processes to keep it going. And so over time, you'll have some sort of injury. So sleep is very, very important. The next thing that I think is incredibly important is proper exercise. So a lot of people here... Uh, that I practice in midtown Manhattan, a lot of people sit in a chair, and they sit in chairs for long periods of time. We've had uh, an influx of the startups come in, so Twitter, Facebook, Google is in the area as well, yes. and really the engineers sit for long periods of time, and so they're adding to the lawyers, accountants, traders that sit as well. And with long periods of sitting, not only do you get weaker, you also get stiffer, and you also stretch out muscles that you don't want. So the whole concept of being active, moving around, keeping the blood flow moving is incredibly important. One of the major things that I do here in the office is I prescribe standing desks. Okay, that's that was, that a was tremendous on my list. <laughs> As I'm talking right now, I'm using a standing desk because what I found, and I had actually back pain for a period of time, was your muscles get so stiff they can't really engage anymore, and so you start getting pain. It's a signal saying we're not really doing things correctly. So by uh, prescribing standing desks, I've had patients do phenomenally well. But it's more likely to be uh, okay through the tech companies as opposed to the more traditional uh, white glove companies here in the city. But it makes a huge, huge difference. So proper exercise, the small habits that you have day-to-day -day are very important. Of course, going to the gym is important, stretching as well. And as you get older, you start seeing more and more of that becoming more beneficial. Have phenomenal patients in their 90s who are in phenomenal shape, but they exercise every single day. Uh, Jack LaLanne, he exercised every day, and he was actually a sick person when he was in his teens, and he became very healthy, and he obviously advertised that nationwide, but he's a great example of if you exercise, you can actually be very strong, and I think you're getting your body to do what it normally would do in the first place. I think the aging process is really that degeneration of muscle tissue and flexibility, and then eventually you can't walk, you can't, you, you balance as bad, you fall all the time, and there's that process. Also, when you lose muscle mass, your testosterone goes down. So that, that ability to keep the muscle mass up, the, the energy that you want or you thought you had um, in your 40s but it was much better in your 20s, you start diminishing that as well. And also thyroid function starts to diminish. You start getting all these trends. Blood flow itself is good just to get blood to the brain to wash out just the toxins day to day as well. So exercise is incredibly important, but not just exercise in the gym once or twice a week. It's about putting daily exercise in your life every single day. 
Yeah, that's, and that's the final true. thing uh, sure. to, to round off the top three would be proper food. And this, we've gone through many, many years of just research with this one. We've gone to courses, we've gone all over the world just talking to experts. And what we find is proper food is really the most important thing. Using the American lifestyle for a moment, we are very rushed and we're running around. So the focus is on quick bites and something that we can microwave very quickly. Being that you're in Madrid, you probably get uh, much slower cooked food that probably is probably better for you. Uh, but yes. it's the quality of the food that is actually the quality of the ingredients first and then the quality of the preparation makes a big difference. And how you chew that food also makes a big difference. How are you getting that material that you're ingesting to actually be absorbed in your body it makes a huge difference. And again, now we've actually we've had a case of a patient who had had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and one of the major interventions were to just make sure she chewed her food well. Of course, food choice was important. She was on board, but she just chewed her food better. And subsequent blood tests uh, actually negated the fact of any sort of autoimmune disease, including juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And she felt 100% better, and she was back to her life and not taking pain medicines, anti-rheumatoid uh, medications, etc. So the big things are really proper sleep, proper exercise, stretching, and proper diet. And, you know, these are the things your mother says. Sure. I just come around with my degree and tell people the same thing. And some people believe me and go for it, and they do profoundly well, and other people don't do very well. That reminds me of a story. One woman came to me. She was in the hospital for a horrible infection called Clostridium difficile, which happens when you've had a huge number of antibiotics introduced in your body. Yes. So what that means is you've gotten rid of all your normal flora, which we are starting to realize is more important, and she had this infection. Well, this infection, of course, really takes a toll on your body because then you get even more powerful antibiotics. So she came to the office and said, you know what, if you don't help me, I'm going to die. And so that was really scary for me. So we went through a lot of these different ideas. And um, to make a long story short, she was going out to fashion week until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning feeling great after about 6 or 8 weeks. So it was wow. that, that was a profound experience for me. She was in her, I think, late 60s, early 70s and really partying with all the young people in fashion week here in the city and having the best time of her life. So that's just another example. And, I mean, we just have just, tons of examples. Wow. Like and how was just to, and how was her her how was she the previous decades then she was kind of declining, she's, progressive yeah, decline. She was on the usual, you know, my my this hurts, my that hurts. One of my yeah. patients described it as an organ recital. My organ this, my liver doesn't work, my shoulder doesn't work. What doctor do you see? And so you have this continuous conversation on the organ recital. And then suddenly you change a couple of things and suddenly you blossom. And, and what was really profound was that she just stopped taking all these medications. She didn't need them anymore. Right. And so, you know, I, I can talk about this and say, you know what, you should do this and you should do that. But I've also done the same thing because I thought if these people are getting better, I should do the same thing. So in our family, we've changed a lot of things and we've seen profound improvement. The one thing that made the biggest difference for me was really my distance vision. It actually got much, much better. Wow. Incredible. So you're... You know, I've noticed lately um, that uh, the, even my, my my near I was I had a problem with vision that I still have, but I'm also noticing that. And I'm actually on my list is that I have to go get my eyes checked again because I feel like my glasses are I'm not as I'm not a mess. I'm going to take them off. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. So it sounds like you're doing it. similar things as well. But it's amazing how simple daily de activities can start having a profound effect later on. And I'm almost trying to think of a way of really encapsulating this and saying just small daily habits in a sense. Yes, yeah. Habits, small habits can be made just hugely powerful, um, much more so than uh, than people would, uh, would imagine, I think. I guess we've had right. a similar experience. Um, wow, this is, uh, this is really great stuff. You know, I I'll share with you a, a quick uh, – this is – Changing the subject here, but uh, I have a, um, a a future dream project that I think uh, you. I know you have a you have some Greek heritage. You've thought about perhaps going to Greece, and uh, one of my dreams is to create a uh, a community of uh, of health minded uh, people who uh, would be living in the Mediterranean. And I have no idea how this might happen, but, uh, you know, uh, this uh, could be, hopefully we could stay in touch about this and um, I'd love to, love for, you know, people like you to be part of that. Well, you're on a travel business. So, I mean, just think about just making people understand how to actually cook their food, how it should be processed, how it should be actually grown. Uh, one, one thing that's been profound for me is 
we actually have a garden uh, outside of the city, and we just we introduce the children to growing vegetables and fruits so they understand where it comes from. And we, we do notice that we feel better when we're eating that stuff versus the commercially grazed uh, stuff in the supermarket. So, you know, a tour where, you know, proper preparation of food, proper sleep, I mean, just, you know, getting yourself out of the rat race for a couple of weeks can make a huge, huge difference. You know, they, they do a lot of that stuff with those uh, retreats, but really not just um, giving you great food, but really instructing you and helping you to, to uh, incorporate it back into your life, I think would make a tremendous difference. Yeah, that, that makes a sounds... difference than what I see when I see patients every day and say, well, it's the same thing over and over and over again. How can you actually make a bigger impact? And that's what we're trying to do here. How do we make a bigger impact? Uh, for patients and really just uh, uh, the worldwide community because living in New York and being really close to the United Nations and just a huge a number of international people, this theme is throughout the world. Yes. Oh, yeah. Especially uh, especially where, unfortunately, we've exported uh, the worst of our food industry, whether it's uh, right. you know the soft drinks and the fast food. And uh, here in Spain, you, uh, you can notice on the street the growing... Uh, certainly not at the U.S. level, but the growing obesity, especially with kids, which really, uh, really uh, is is terrible to see. But right, uh, absolutely, yeah, that's all over. Well, I I just want to be conscious of your time, and I um, I think we need we should probably Great. wrap things up here. Uh, let me just w one last question: if there's um, if there's one uh, one thing that you're most um, most excited about for the future, what would it be? I think for me as a physician, it's the concept of personalized medicine, really digging into that genome, understanding how the genes work, the proteins, and all these molecular switches. There's something called systems biology, and it really uses a lot of computing power to actually know every single switch, and if you change that switch, what would happen? Yes. And they've actually done this for simple organisms like the nematode, so they know exactly every single switch and what that will turn into further down. I think we have the possibility of doing that as well in medicine. If we can do that, it's going to make a tremendous difference in all of these diseases that we're having a lot of difficulty in treating, high blood pressure, cholesterol issues, uh, cancers, etc. So I'm really, really excited by that. I hope it happens in my lifetime. I'm not sure. But we can start making small steps because we do know that the way you live your life, the foods that you eat, and how you uh, interact with your environment actually does change how your genes are actually turned on or off. And so think of it as you're manipulating your own genes based on the decisions and the behaviors that you have. So it's a really small rudimentary steps now, but that's going to be really exciting. That personalized medicine approach should be wonderful when it starts. Oh, that's, that is. What about 20, have you done anything with 23 and Me? I'm sorry, 23? 23, 23 oh, and Me. Um, no, we haven't done anything with that because it's more of a, it's not really a medical product. It's more of a right. um, uh, consumer product. Uh, we don't know how to take that information and change it. I think it was wonderful to have more information. We just don't have enough sure. clinical things that we can do with that to change it. Right. I'm all, it your, your genome, see, this is what's interesting, and this is what people get confused with. Your genome is just basically a computer program, mm -hmm. let's say. The way that interacts with itself and the environment is where we really need to be. And that's what's more difficult to understand because there's certain proteins and molecules that are made up. And we're, it's very difficult to understand how those are made up and what is actually producing the switch to turn on the production of it or to turn it off. And then once they are turned on, how are they interacting with each other? So I think the genetic or the, the decoding of the genome is really a great start. Yeah. But that next level of the systems biology is really going to be the, the place where the, this personalized medicine really takes off. Wow, fascinating stuff. So that would get into epigenetics as well, perhaps. Oh, the, yes, yes. The telomeres. Yes. I'm sorry? And the tel you know, maintain, trying to maintain the telomere. Or the correct, correct. We're really at the infancy right now with this, but it's uh, in the next couple of decades, it's going to be tremendous. I'm really excited for the future. Fantastic. Well, Dr. Panagos, this has been a, uh, a great pleasure and uh, really insightful conversation. Uh, so thanks so much for making time. We'd love to have you have you on the show again uh, down the road. And um, I'm sure we've got you've got plenty of other uh, great things that uh, people would love to hear about. Absolutely. Thank you, Dan, for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Sure. And oh, one last thing for people that want, would, might want to get into contact you uh, would uh, what's the best way to find you? Uh, the easiest way is just to type in my name uh, into Google and my, my our website and all our, our um, 
things that we do come up uh, were uh, at the website specifically for the practice, ssmny.com, that's Spine and Sports Medicine of New York. But really, my name would be fine too because really we're starting to just get more stuff on the internet because we see people are actually finding us through the things we're putting on because there seems to be a significant demand for it. Because people want to be healthy, they want to live their life, they want to be great husbands, fathers, mothers, caregivers, employees, business owners, they want to do the best job possible. And I think sure. these small little things are making a big difference. And I think also it's making a tremendous difference in people's lives. And also, I'm not, I don't know if there's no research yet, but probably longevity as well. Well, yes, I'm sh- great. This will, this will be fascinating and be, to talk to you again down the road and, uh, and, and uh, as this, this whole area develops. So, uh, right. Of course, so, thank you, Dan. Yes, thank you again. Have a great day. And uh, this will, just so you know, this will go up on YouTube um, bef- uh, sometime early in January. And okay. uh, then we'll be launching on iTunes in, in early February. Oh, congratulations. That's great. Yes. Yeah, so we'll, you'll be uh, you'll be among the uh, the pioneers for us. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever I can do to help. I mean, really, if we can get this information out, I think it makes a big difference. There, there's no amount of information that's enough to really get people to engage because what we find is that the medical community is just having a hard time really embracing this because it's so against everything. And also, in medical yeah. school, we actually don't teach this. Sure. We really don't teach this. We teach the the big, huge breakthroughs, and it's been really fun to go through those, but. Um, we're having a hard time to convince people that if they make good choices sooner rather than later, they're going to actually have a lower risk of having back surgery, lower risk of having high blood pressure, high cholesterol. I mean, all these things that we assume are part of the aging process, which really, really are not. And and um, the, the reason I even, even thought about this is because I have relatives in Greece that don't take medicine yes. in their late 80s. They live their life and everything's fine, whereas <laughs> I, relatives here are a little sicker. Yes. Hey, high blood that's... pressure, high cholesterol, I need my joint replaced, you know, diabetes. It says something. Yes, that's uh, very insightful. I see the same thing here in Spain with my wife's uh, family. Um, you know, most of her grandparents are in their in their 90s. And, uh, wow. You know, so, uh, well, yeah, gr- very insightful. Well, Dr. Uh, Dr. Panagos, once again, congratulations for your, your work and uh, your insight and what you're doing. I think it's fantastic stuff and uh, look forward to staying in touch with you. Uh, Absolutely. Good luck with the launch in January, Dan. Yes. And have a yes. great holiday, too. Oh, yeah. I will, we'll let you know once, uh, as, we, as we get, these, uh, get your uh, interview online and uh, we'll reach out to you on Twitter and uh, – um, so, uh, so, so that you can let your people know as well. Awesome, awesome. I really appreciate it. Thanks my, for the opportunity. My pleasure. And, uh, yeah, thank you again. Bye-bye now. It was a pleasure. Thank you.